Hi everyone, welcome to the December 1st edition of the Timeform US Pacecast. I'm David Aragon, and I'll be joined in just a moment by my co-host Craig Mulkowski. This week on the podcast, we're going to take a look back at the major stakes racing from Churchill Downs, Del Mar, and Aqueduct. We had a few grade one races on the schedule last week, including the Clark at Churchill Downs, some of the top older horses on the dirt in action there. We had a series of turf races at Del Mar, including the grade one Matriarch and the grade one Hollywood Derby. And at Aqueduct, we had some minor stakes races scattered throughout the weekend, I think topped by a couple of impressive three-year-old performances in both the Cumley and the Discovery, but we'll get to that at the end of the show. Uh, Craig, it was a pretty exciting weekend of racing, really the first major weekend since the Breeders' Cup, and now uh, we're here we are at the end of the year. We've made it to December somehow, and it seems like a lot of these major races are in the books at this point. Yeah, it was a really fun weekend of racing. I wanted to be, you know, the get off my lawn guy and gripe about the cigar mile not being in its usual spot the last couple of years. Uh, but I couldn't because it, it was just a really good, uh, good week of racing and looking forward to talking about it. I, I thought there were some really good performances. I thought some of the races were a little bit of a letdown from a speed figure perspective. So let's get to it. And let's start at Churchill Downs, where they ran that grade one event on Friday's card, uh, the grade one Clark. And this one obviously featured Code of Honor, one of the top three-year-olds from last year, who's kind of been struggling to find an identity this year. Um, he ran so well going a mile early in the year in the Met, Met Mile. Uh disappointed a little bit over the summer and throughout the fall and I think a lot of people including you and I expected him to get back on track here and uh he was a little underwhelming for me as Bodie Express got the job done I thought both of these horses got good trips and Bodie Express was just a little better on the day yeah he surprised me a little bit he had run a big race last time out with a 119 uh time form U.S. speed figure Got a 120 for this win. Uh, he showed he could do something he had never really done before, which was read a little bit off of horses. Uh, if I remember right, I think all his wins had come in wire-to-wire -wire fashion. So it, it was a good effort by him. Uh, I don't want to take too much away for, from him, but this is one of the races figure-wise that was disappointing for me. I mean, this is a grade one race, and it was a good 10 points below average. Uh, at least maybe 8 to 10 points, because that grade one average is usually about a 128, 130 for older males so you know he got the job done code of honor was obviously disappointing uh i saw some talk about his trip and not not being ideal and a bad ride but i, I didn't really see that i think if he was good enough he would have got the win here uh, based on his prior races and he just doesn't seem this to be the same horse to me and then we had owendale back in third he he basically ran the same race he always runs. And at this point, I think it's fair to say he's just a grade three kind of horse because that's the races where he wins. Yeah, I know you and I were skeptical of Pony Express going into this race, as were a lot of people. He went off at 11 to 1, despite coming in with one of the better speed figures. Uh, it was just for the first time that he had translated that form from Gulfstream and Gulfstream Park West up north. Uh, he had disappointed a lot out of town, and uh, he, able, he was able to bring his best form here. So, I mean, credit to him for finally putting it all together. Personally, I saw nothing wrong with Code of Honor's trip. I thought John Velasquez gave him a great ride. I mean, he was in traffic a little bit uh, coming down the back stretch and around the far turn, but it was just that he was in and among horses. It wasn't the kind of traffic where John Velasquez ever had to steady him or, or lose momentum. He always kept him going forward, and Code of Honor is not the kind of horse that's ever shied away from racing in traffic or coming through some tight spots in the past. Uh, so, he popped him out with plenty of time to get by Bodie Express in the stretch, and he just couldn't do it. Uh, what I think might have worked against him, if anything did, was that they did slow down the pace quite a bit in the middle portion of this race, and it gave the front runners, including Bodie Express, a bit of a breather, and it allowed him to really come home pretty quickly. But still, the good code of honor should have run him down anyway, and he just couldn't get there. I mean, perhaps the horse that was most compromised was Owendale, but that's just Owendale's running style. He's always going to be up against it in races that don't feature fast paces. Yeah, I would totally agree about Code of Honor. The pace did slow down, but he was close enough. Uh, he should have been able to make up that ground if he was in top form and the true grade one horse that some thought he was. Include Well, I, I wouldn't say I thought he was. I, I was skeptical, but I thought he was the class of the race, and he just didn't show it. He had every chance here, and not really a whole lot to add on the others for me. I mean, some of the horses ran okay, but I mean, this was closer to a grade three than a grade one for me, so. Uh, I assume maybe one or two of these will show up in the Pegasus, but uh, depending how that field shapes up, it would be hard for me to back any of them. 
Yeah, we're going to talk about some horses later in the podcast that I think are already running speed figures that are comparable to this Clark and have plenty of upside as they are three-year-olds now turning four years old. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but I agree with you about the quality of this Clark. Uh, turning it back one day to Thanksgiving at Churchill Downs, uh, that was last Thursday. They ran the grade two fall city for the Phillies and mares going that same mile and an eighth distance. And this was a breakout performance by the winner on Vutant. Uh, I think a lot of people expected a three-year-old filly to win this race, but it wasn't this one. Uh, as Bonnie South, the favorite, she could only manage to finish second, but a distantly beaten second as on Vutant just went to the front and widened from there. Yeah, it was a race we talked about on the uh, the pace cast last week in our hybrid version of the race. And uh, it's one where we thought whoever got the lead would, would have a big advantage, but it turned out it wasn't our super freak in this case. It was Zen Vuitton, who hadn't shown a lot of early speed at any other point, but uh, all credit to Brian Hernandez, who just took this horse right to the front, uh, set a slow pace. All our pace figures are coated in blue for this race and just... Gave nobody else a chance. Uh, the final time figure was a 117. I uh, actually gave this race a bit of a pace upgrade. Uh, so she got a 120 overall time form US speed figure. Because it was a race where the pace was so slow that it kind of affected the figures of the vast majority of the field. So that's why I gave it the upgrade here. But just a really good effort from her. And be interesting to see if uh, it was just a situational thing where they went to the lead. Or this is a... Uh, horse who's going to be showing more speed going forward yeah i mean it definitely helped that there just wasn't really other speed drawn in this race especially after they decided not to ride our super freak aggressively i mean it did just kind of hand on Vuitton to a very favorable situation and a horse like bonnie south is just always going to be compromised under those circumstances. Uh, she was closer to the pace than I think some people would have expected her to be. But still, when you've got a horse that's running along in the front end through such comfortable fractions, it's always hard to run them down. Not to say that Bonnie South was was the best horse in this race. She, I mean, was cl far and away um, a superior to her on the day. Uh, but uh, it, I think the race dynamics had a lot to do with the margin between those two. But this was a fast race for a three-year-old filly. I mean, I know we're now at the very end of November heading into December uh, but still 120 is a good number and it feels like we've got a lot of three-year-old fillies that are running numbers right around there and I think many of them are staying in training next year so I hope that we have a, an exciting year among the older horses because I know the three-year-old males things are looking very promising in that division as they turn four years old so I think we have some things to look forward to through the winter and into next year. Yeah, and that's the one good thing about, well, there's lots of good things, but one good thing about fillies and mares is they tend to stick around and race more because they can actually earn more money winning purses than, than go into the breeding shed. So I'm always excited for this division, and it looks like a strong one it is getting even stronger. And as for Bonnie South, uh, she's just a solid filly, but she's always going to be up against it. She was a little closer, as you say, but that had to do with the slow pace, I think. I mean, for her to be 10 or 15 lengths back would have they'd almost had to drag her back there at some point so she's just a horse who gets bet a lot but I, I think for the time being she's always going to be a bet against until she can show some more tactical speed moving on to Saturday at Churchill Downs they had their Entire card of two-year-old races topped by a pair of graded stakes, the Goldenrod and the Kentucky Jockey Club. Uh, I think a lot of people expected the Goldenrod to be a pretty easy victory for Simply Ravishing after she ran so well in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, but... It we see don't we don't see that many horses race again immediately after the Breeders' Cup. But, you know, it's not the first time that we've seen horses come back in three or four weeks after the Breeders' Cup and regress. And that was certainly the case with Simply Ravishing as she did not show up here. And we had some improving fillies really uh, break out and shine, including the winner, Travel Column, who had been beaten pretty soundly by Simply Ravishing and the Alcibiades. But she took a huge step forward here for Brad Cox and got the victory despite uh, a somewhat uncomfortable trip. Yeah, I would say that was uh, not the greatest trip for sure. Uh, she broke bad, uh, made a nice move up into the pace, kind of got hemmed in a little bit, had to swing wide. Uh, it's worth a watch if you don't get the uh, if you haven't seen it yet. 
Uh, she got a 102 time form US speed figure for the win. I think she probably would have gone a little faster uh, had she not had all that trouble. Uh, the pace wasn't overly quick. It was solid, but I wouldn't say it actually set up or run from the back of the pack. Uh, it certainly didn't hurt her. It wasn't like they were crawling up front, but I just thought this was a really good effort from her. Uh, I heard uh, our friend Andy Serling talking about this, and, and you know I love Andy and, and respect him, but he said this wasn't that tough a trip, he didn't think, and, and I personally disagree. I mean, I think it was pretty bad, particularly the start more so than the stretch. It just took took her totally out of position so you know it's one where I think she ran better than looked and as we're going to talk about in the next race they still managed to run a bit faster than the boys did in the Kentucky Jockey Club I would say it was a bad trip but Florent Giroux did everything right after the start um it, it was a bad trip but not a bad ride because uh, he was dealt a bad hand by her breaking about a length slowly and then getting squeezed back. But I thought Florent Giroux after that took every opportunity to gradually move forward. He saved some ground on her. Uh, and the filly took him there. I mean, she was running very willingly throughout the entire race. She was always traveling well, but just was doing it in a little bit of traffic. And... Uh, Maybe he was a little awkward getting to the outside in the stretch, uh, but uh, I thought all things considered, Florent did a lot of things right in the race uh, that presented a difficult set of circumstances for him. And she's a promising filly because she hadn't shown this kind of running style in the past. I mean, she had actually been right on top of a pretty quick pace when she won her debut going six furlongs at Churchill back in September. And uh, she wasn't that far off the pace in the Alcibiades when she was beaten by Simply Ravishing. So it's nice to see her show this new dimension. She's going to have to get a little faster in the future. But as you were suggesting, I think you can upgrade this performance a little bit based on that poor start. And I also think there was just some quality behind her in this race. The runner-up, Clarier, she's definitely a promising filly for Steve Asperson. She is um, the daughter of that uh, excellent Stone Street Kieran McLaughlin horse cavorting from a number of years ago. Um, and Simply Ravishing didn't show up here. But I mean, it's not like she completely fell apart. I mean, she was on top of the pace and finished a, a close fourth. So I think this was a decent race overall, but the winner was certainly best. Yeah, I, the only thing I would say, you make a great point. It, it was a fabulous ride by Florent Giroux after the start. Uh, any misstep would have, and this horse doesn't win. So uh, I totally agree with your sentiment there. Yeah, and it does seem like the Philly race was a stronger one than the version for the males later on, the Kentucky Jockey Club, as uh, Keep Me In Mind finally got that maiden victory. Uh, they've been pressing on in graded stakes races ever since his first start, which was a, a narrow loss. And uh, he came out of that third place finish in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile uh, to get the victory here, though this was not the strongest field and not the fastest race. No, it wasn't. Uh, and what was interesting here, a lot of times when we get final times that, that don't aren't what you really expect. Uh, it can be attributed to pace, but the Goldenrod and the Kentucky Jockey Club basically had the same exact pace uh, in the race. So it's not a race where the final time is because of the pace. It's just a matter that the Phillies were faster. And not to take too much away for me for keep me in mind, because he's just a stone closer who... You know, it's hard to judge closers on speed figures at times. Uh, sometimes they can run faster when the pace is fast. They're, they're just going to do what they have to. So I'm not going to knock him too much because he was able to win the race, but he still only got a 97, quite a regression from his Breeders' Cup Juvenile, where he got a 109, finishing third. But the others, uh, it's hard for me to get too excited about him. I mean, the runner-up, Smiling Sabatka, uh, he did improve his figure 10 points. He's certainly moving in the right direction. Uh, could say the same for the third-place finisher, that they did improve on their prior figures, but they still have a way to go to uh, really challenge at the top of this division. Yeah, I think you make a good point about keeping me in mind in the way that the, the trip played out uh, for a horse with his kind of running style, because when you get a closer or deep closer like this in a race of inferior horses, they're a little bit handicapped by how fast everybody else runs because a lot of these closers are not going to draw off and win by 10 lengths like a speed horse might. 
Uh, and David Cohen rode him in a manner that um, he was never going to win by five legs because this horse was kept in last the entire way. He was still last coming around the far turn, even at the 5 sixteenths pole, and was really given the task of passing everybody on the stretch. And you're just not going to earn a fast speed figure in that situation when they're setting a merely moderate pace up front. Uh, so I wouldn't downgrade keep me in mind too much off his Breeders' Cup performance. And we saw how much uh, Simply Ravishing regressed from the Breeders' Cup. So, I mean, it's always a big ask for these horses to come back after peaking on Breeders' Cup day. And um, just nice to see him finally get a victory. And we'll see what he does next year. I don't think he's the best two-year-old out there by any stretch, but I wouldn't get too down on him based on this performance. Yeah, you you explained that much better than I did when I tried. So I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, let, let's... Talk about one more race from Churchill Downs before we move on to other venues. Um, that was an allowance race from early in the day on Friday. And Silver State, who is a horse that was on the Derby Trail early in the year uh, at the fairgrounds and had some... He didn't disappoint a little bit, took a lot of money in some of those races like the LeCompte and the Risen Star and just never really took a step forward. Well, they gave him the entire summer off, and it seems like he's come back a completely different horse this fall. He was so impressive in uh, his allowance victory at Keeneland in October. And once again here, I mean, he just put in a commanding performance. I know the margin was just two and three quarter lengths, but uh, he was much the best in this race. He was. Uh, he wound up with a 113 time form U.S. speed figure, but that's actually downgraded quite a bit because of the pace. Uh, we have all the fractions coded in blue. Uh, I did want to mention the difference between this race and a race like the Fall City where I did the pace upgrade on it is in this case, it, it would have probably artificially inflated the figures of a bunch of horses in this field. They would all gotten top. So uh, it wasn't comfortable doing that. But I, I think it's safe to say the winner, Silver State, is probably more that 120 type horse right now than a 113 that he got for this victory. Uh, but it was really good. The only question I have with him now is, is sprinting what he's going to be good at? Because both his wins so far have come at seven furlongs. Uh, he's done it very impressively. Or is is he going to stretch back out and see if he can handle the distance? Uh, the way he ran this race it shows that he can rate, and it certainly uh, should be within his scope. But I'm just curious where they'll go go from here. Uh, I don't think I not talk about this or talk about this race without mentioning Dennis's moment, who was for a time the uh, favorite in the Kentucky Derby uh, future bets last year. But he finally returned to the races after a disappointing uh, effort in Florida this year. And he, he's just not the same horse. Things aren't right with him. He uh, he went off two to one second choice and just never really ran a step. So I was sorry to see that personally because we never have enough good horses. Yeah, Dennis's moment looked like such a future star in the summer of 2019, and he just he just never went on. He ran those two amazing races, really that well, that that one amazing race, and and uh, he also won the Iroquois impressively. Uh, but he just has not been the same horse ever since. And uh, you wonder, some horses just go sour after a while, and it seems like that's what's happened with him. Uh, but Silver State, the winner of this race, I have a similar question to you. I mean, based on the way he's won these two races, drawing off so impressively and finishing with such power through the final furlongs of these seven furlong races it would lead you to believe that he should be able to get at least a mile a mile and a 16th and not really have trouble doing that um he didn't really progress when they stretched him out as an early season three-year-old but he could just be a different horse now his pedigree um does lean a little bit more towards probably sprinting distances under a mile uh but you never know i think they have a right to try it from here uh, and it'll be interesting to follow him because he just seems like a very promising horse who's passed these late season tests with ease. Yeah, I, I would certainly give him another shot at, at a mile or even around two turns. Uh, I wouldn't get carried away, but I mean, that's there's better money there. So he's done nothing wrong. And it's not like his efforts were terrible this year at the fairgrounds when he tried those uh, derby preps. Uh, so I'd give him another shot but because you can always turn back and try the sprints again. But he's just looked really good. He, he looks like a different horse than he did. He's developed. Uh, he's a bigger, stronger horse. So yeah, give him another shot. And if not, you always have sprints uh, in your back pocket. Let's move out to Delmar, where they ran a series of turf stakes this past weekend, uh, including a couple of grade ones. One of those was the grade one Hollywood Derby on Saturday. Uh, this one featured a meeting of the top 
three-year-old turf horses from the East Coast and the top from the West Coast, uh, that just being Smooth Like Straight. And it turned out to be a pretty good matchup as Smooth Like Straight ran his race, was on top of the pace, took over in deep stretch. But the the late kicks of those uh, two East Coast horses, Domestic Spending and Goofo, I mean, they really made it close at the end and Domestic Spending was just able to get up here. Yeah, I mean, this was a fun race. It had basically all the three-year-olds that were at the top of the division throughout the season showed up and faced off. And they all, most of them, I think, if not all of the top four, ran uh, career highs on the time form U.S. speed figure scale. Uh, domestic spending was able to get the win. He got a 118 for the win. And smooth like straight, just a head back also did. Uh, and Gufo was a close third and. and a lot of that could be the pay, uh, the post position that he had uh, because he, he definitely just had to drop back the last, lost some, some valuable position to the others and was flying late. So maybe with a better post, he wins the race. Uh, I will say we don't have any pace figures for this because they're, they're doing a lot of things out at Del Mar and they're doing different run-ups. They've remeasured the course and things like that. There was an article about it where they moved some of the poles. So I don't really have a baseline yet, but now that the meeting's closed, I am going to go back and make sure I do have pace figures for these races, assuming there's a, at least a moderate sample size and add those in because I don't want to have a grade one race where we don't know what the pace was. But looking at it, I mean, we had the uh, one, two uh, leaders early finish second and fourth. The one, three finishers were from way in the back of the pack. So my guess would be it was a fairly uh, fair pace. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it was a fair pace. Um, Domestic spending a goofo. I think they both ran very well in here. Domestic spending um, was never on the rail. He was off it basically for the entirety of the race. Um, goofo was at the very back of the pack, as you said, due to that post position. Flavian Pratt really had no choice but to take him far back. And he's a horse that just that's where he runs from. Um, they both came with powerful late runs. Goofo was finishing fastest of all. He's just a really cool horse who has a monster late kick on him. And he always finishes strongly, just doesn't always get there because he leaves himself with so much to do. But these are good horses and domestic spending. We haven't seen him that much. He's just run five times, but he's one of these overseas purchases for Klarovich and Chad Brown that's really worked out. He's now on four of those five starts and they sent him off at four to one in this race, even though he had beaten a lot of these horses in that Saratoga Derby last time. And the form of that race really held up here as uh, he uh, beat those same horses, including Smooth Like Straight uh, in addition to that. So uh, I think this was a strong race in that 118 time form US speed figure suggests that this is probably a stronger group of three-year-old turf horses than what we saw in these same races last year. Yeah, I meant to mention that. They're definitely moving in the right direction, getting closer and closer to older horses, as you would expect. And often it takes uh, three-year-olds a little longer to catch up on turf than it does on dirt. But this is a good group, and they're moving in the right direction. And definitely look forward to seeing a bunch of these run back as four-year-olds. The grade one event at Del Mar on Sunday was the matriarch going a mile for the Phillies and mares on the turf. And Chad Brown had a big weekend out in California. He even won a race, I believe, on Thursday there, uh, which we're not going to talk about uh, with uh, or Glond. I think that was the red carpet. And uh, he earned, I think, a third graded stakes uh, in this uh, major, or I should say a fourth, because I think he also won with a two-year-old Fluffy Sox, uh, but a fourth stakes victory on Sunday in this matriarch. He sent out three runners. Um, it was the two bigger prices, though, that battled to the wire as Viadera just got up. This was a vintage Joel Rosario ride as he just waited and waited and waited. And once this filly got into the clear, she just uh, kicked on and got up for the victory. Yeah, and it was a close one, but it was a very well-timed ride by Joel Rosario, as we've grown accustomed to. He finished strong and was able to to just get up over poor Blowout, who just seems to get run down late all the time in these races. Uh, I think she's lost her last three races by about a total of maybe less than a half a length. So, you know, good on her, but just a good effort from Viadera. She got a 119 time form U.S. speed figure. It was a pretty quick pace in here. Uh, Blowout took the early early lead and then Juliet Foxtrot with Mike Smith kind of made that Mike Smith middle move that, that's often pretty perplexing and really sped things up but uh, Viadera just uh, Joel Rosario bided his time and was able to get the win. I thought this was a really interesting betting race from a betting standpoint because uh, the two three-year-olds actually took the most money in here and really 
I mean, it was almost like a Princess Noor situation in the uh, juvenile fillies where neither one of them really had the figures to to beat the older horses and they weren't able to do so. So it's one of those uh, you just got to look for as a handicapper where horses get bet on reputation and trainer, but just don't have the numbers. Yeah, we didn't handicap this race on the pace cast last week because it was run on Sunday. Um, But I kind of wish that we had because, uh, I mean, I don't. Get, I don't. I, I just don't understand why they would bet a horse like Tommy here. I know she was visually impressive when she won that race uh, at Belmont in the fall. I think it was the Sands Point. Um, but I mean, she was coming in with inferior speed figures, and I know she looked good winning that race. But you watch the horses coming back out of it and subsequent starts, and that was just a really weak group of three-year-old fillies. And for some reason, they made her the favorite against older horses who were running so much faster than her. I just didn't get that at all. And it was no surprise to me that she was not really in the mix at any point in this race. Um, I feel bad for Blowout. I mean, she's finished second now four times in a row. But as you said, I mean, she's always right there. And it's not like she's a hanger. I mean, she's trying to win these races. Uh, she just has that front running style. Sometimes they make her go too fast. That was certainly the case last time out in the Noble Damsel. And uh, she tries to win. She's just found a couple horses that have been better than her. And now the Adara twice in a row. Uh, but credit to the winner and credit to the ride that Joel Rosario gave her. Chad Brown has her going in great form. That's now three victories in a row for her. And seems like she's found her niche as a miler in the U.S. Moving on to the Sea Biscuit, which was run on Saturday at Del Mar. This one's a grade two event going a mile on the 16th for the older horses on the turf. And uh, Count Again, who is a horse that had previously been based at Woodbine with Gail Cox, uh, part of a Samsung farm dispersal. Now he's co-owned uh, by Agave Racing, and uh, he's going to be campaigned in California for the, the immediate future. That Woodbine form really held up as I thought he ran extremely well to win this race coming from far back to get up for the victory. He did. Uh, unfortunately, this is another race where I don't have pace figures yet, but he ran big. He got a 124 time form U.S. speed figure for the win. Uh, the best that, that I think he's run by far in his PPs. I remember he was a horse that surprised me in the sing spiel when he got up the win at 9-1 to one that day. Uh, he switched to the barn of Phil D'Amato, who's also always super dangerous, particularly on turf with these new acquisitions. And he was allowed to go off at, I think it was 8 or 9-1. to one, And I don't think there was anything fluky about this win at all. It was a really solid performance. Uh, he was able to beat Flavius from, as you mentioned, the red hot Chad Brown barn out at Del Mar this weekend. And just a big effort. So I, I would expect more of the same if he remains out in Southern California. Yeah, I didn't feel like this was a race that completely fell apart. He was pretty far back, even at the top of this stretch, and he just ran these horses down. I was impressed by it. Uh, there was a bit of an incident on the far turn as one bad boy made a premature move to take the lead as they broke for the far turn. And he it seemed like something went a little a miss with him as they headed around the far turn and Flavi and Pratt had to very abruptly pull him up. And that did affect some horses in behind, especially another twist to fate who, um, Joel Rosario had sort of let Flavi and Pratt go on right before that happened. And he got briefly caught in behind that horse. He had a steady spirit animal had to steady a little bit on the inside. And it kind of gave the advantage to the horses making outside runs, which included count again and Flavius. Um, I don't think either of those horses that got caught inside were ever going to win the race. Um, but it's just worth noting it's a race that you might want to watch again from a trips perspective yeah i'll be honest another twist of fate really surprised me i i was kind of surprised at the odds he went off at uh i don't remember if he was the favorite or not i think he was two to one in there and he was coming off he had had that long layoff and then he came back at emerald and one on the dirt with a slow figure and i kept looking going what are people betting and granted he didn't win but he got a 120 time form us speed figure had a little bit of trouble so i thought he ran a, a surprisingly good race for me and one more race to discuss from Del Mar this past weekend, that was the Grade 2 Hollywood Turf Cup on their Friday card. And this one played out in a pretty logical fashion. We had talked about it on the Pace Cast last week. The two best horses on paper were clearly Arclo and Lucario, and they just finished 1-2 here. 
They did. It, it was about as expected, and, and frankly, I think the difference in the w- the difference in who won was the ride. Joel Rosario gave just a great ride. He had Arclo up closer than he normally is, and, and when I say that, I'm not knocking Manny Franco's ride at all. I just think uh, Joel Rosario had better tactical speed. He had better inside position and took advantage, so he was able to get the win. No surprise that the two shippers from the East Coast were able to dominate. Uh, Arclo got his usual 124 time form us speed figure uh 123 for lucario so solid efforts from both i don't really have a whole lot to add i don't think there was too much in the way of trips or anything like that uh, i did think acclimate ran pretty well in his return he had been off for quite a while i think it was from the breeders cup last year so if he can stay healthy he'll certainly be a force in the, in the california races Yeah, Joel Rosario sometimes has a tendency to take chances, even with some short prices. And I I like that he just rode Arklow like he was the best horse in this race. He made a a bit of a middle move on the backstretch to get him into the clear and get him in position to go by Acclimate once they got into the stretch. And uh, he just got the jump on Lucario, as you said. And Lucario ran fine in this race. He doesn't have that same turn of foot as some other horses. So he was sort of grinding away at the end that he just couldn't quite get there. I did think the third place finisher, say the word, ran quite well. Well, um, we didn't see horses making big runs from the back of the pack, at least in the stretch of this race. And he was finishing much faster than anybody else. And like uh, Count Again, who won the Seabiscuit, this is another horse who was part of that Samsung dispersal and is with Phil D'Amato at this point. And he was really um, getting into career form for Gail Cox previous to coming to California. And it seems like he's continued that development for the new barn. So he could be one to look forward to if they keep him in training next year. Oh, for sure. And I mean, we know Phil D'Amato does very well in these turf races. And assuming he stays west, uh, he's acclimates going to have to deal with him. Red King, uh, hopefully United will come back and, and, you know, it should be a a really fun division to watch. All right, let's head to our final venue we're going to discuss on this podcast. That's up to Aqueduct in the north. And uh, let's start with those three-year-old races that they ran on Saturday and Friday, uh, begin with, beginning with the grade three discovery for the three-year-old Colts and Geldings. And this was um, a performance that for me was kind of reminiscent of when Performer won this race last year and looked like such a breakout star. And I think we saw something similar with Force Dioro, who is a lightly raced horse coming into this race, uh, had just uh, made one start off the layoff, an impressive allowance victory in his prior start. And he took a huge step forward here because I know there were just four rivals, but this was a pretty good field of horses who had run some fast speed figures coming in and he just dominated them. Yeah, he did. I mean, the pace was pretty quick. We have the early fractions coded in red, the quarter and the half mile. But it's not like he came from a million lengths behind. He was only about two lengths back for most of the race. And he just powered by everybody in the stretch. Uh, He got a 122 time form US speed figure, which is really strong for a horse making uh, I forget if it's his third or fourth start I know there haven't been a whole lot of them and he beat a, a really good horse in Monday morning quarterback a, a horse who is coming out of a nice win in the Maryland Million Classic with a good figure of 119 so I mean the future is really bright for this win. Uh, Monday morning quarterback ran well as he always does uh, he got a 122 as well uh, he seems to be a, a good horse maybe this is about the distance limit for him or maybe just a little bit beyond his scope but I mean they weren't beating up on uh, any slouches here shared sense is a horse who had had won a big race I think it was the Indiana Derby earlier this year with a decent figure I mean he's solid enough so attachment raid he was a, a veteran of the triple crown wars and they just beat those horses easily so I, I think this was a really strong race for uh, three-year-olds No, I remember watching this race live. I had liked Monday morning quarterback, and I thought Dylan Davis gave him a great ride. Um, The pace was maybe slightly on the fast side, but he was doing it easily up front and looked like he had plenty of horse coming into the stretch. And you could just see Forza Diora right behind him. Junior Alvarado had much more horse underneath him as he was actually restraining him a little bit coming to the top of the stretch. And once he tipped him out, this horse just showed such an impressive turn of foot, almost finishing like a turf horse on the dirt as he really kicked away from these at the end. And um, he's a horse that had run very slowly as a two-year-old, but had been visually impressive in a couple of races at Belmont in the fall of 2019. And 
he, it seems like he's just the time away did him so much good. He's really filled out, just turned into a different kind of horse. He used to have gait issues where he would break extremely slowly in his races. That has it was an issue when he uh, made that first start off the layoff in October. It was not an issue in this race. He broke fine and tracked up close to the pace and finished so strongly. Uh, this is a horse that I think you 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 can legitimately get excited about for next year, assuming that he continues on this path. Yeah, I looked it up. This was actually his fifth start. Uh, interesting enough, he had run three times as a two-year-old, as you mentioned, and he ran in the upper 80s each time. But since he's come back, uh, he's run a 109 and now a 122. Uh, I do want to ask you, what do you think about his breeding? What is, I mean, he just handled a mile and an eight, so obviously he's not a sprinter being by Spatestown. Uh, we know he's a really versatile sire, but what do you think will eventually be his best? Yeah, I mean, I just love these Spites Towns. It seems like they can do anything. I he, a Progeny of his now have now won this race two years in a row. Performers also by Spites Town. And I know some people paint Spites Town as a sire of turf horses or sprint horses. But, I mean, he gets plenty of horses that can go longer distances. So um, I think Forza Diarra is just another example of that. And there's a ton of stamina and quality on the dam side of this pedigree. His dam was actually a turf router. And I know Bill Mott um, was floating the idea of running him on turf over the summer at Saratoga. He actually worked him on the Oklahoma turf course a couple times, and he got some very positive workout reports for those turf drills. So, I mean, they have no reason to try the turf at this point because he's done so well on the dirt, uh, but he is bred to do it if they ever want to try it. And even deeper in this female family, there's just so much quality. His dams half to Golding's Green, who was a very good horse in the Midwest a number of years ago, won like the Hawthorne Gold Cup. He's also related to cross traffic if you go deeper in his female family. Uh, so, this horse has a real pedigree to be a good dirt router um, if you dig deeper in that pedigree. So uh, I, I just think there, there's nothing to knock about this horse and just plenty to get excited about for his four-year-old season. On Friday at Aqueduct, we saw a similar breakout for performance from the three-year-old Phillies uh, in the grade three comely as Mrs. Danvers, uh, kind of like Forza Dioro, a horse that had shown real promise as a two-year-old and Hadn't quite gone on after that. Uh, she came back over the summer and was a little bit of a disappointment in some races, but they added blinkers in her prior start and tried a new running style here by sending her to the front. And it just seems like that really made things click into place. And she traveled much better, was not as rank as she had been in prior starts racing on the lead. And she just ran away from these horses in the lane. She did. Uh, she got a 118 time form U.S. speed figure, uh, which is the best of her career. I know on our last show, we had kind of questioned her figure from two starts back, and, and I said I was going to take a look, but I, I couldn't really find a reason to change it. And this race certainly isn't going to make me want to change it, as she showed that maybe that wasn't a fluke. Uh, it was a really nice effort from her. I do think she got some assistance when Gail broke poorly, and she would have been the other speed or maybe the horse she would have had to track, but... I don't know that it would have mattered. She looked so good. I mean, it wasn't like she set a slow pace. None of our fractions are in blue. She just took command. She was uh, kind of challenged a little bit early on, but she had plenty left and drew away, and she was just much the best in this field. Yeah, I think if you lay this race on top of the Discovery, it was a much slower pace than that race. We do have all of those Discovery fractions color-coded red and have those horses going quite fast up front. So this race did go much slower early than that race over the same distance, albeit on different days. Um, but still, Mrs. Danvers is a horse that I had always questioned going longer because not because of her pedigree, but because of her temperament. It seemed like she would fight the rider and get so rank in her races, even when Joel Rosario was her regular rider and he's so good at getting horses to settle in behind, he just couldn't get a handle on her and get her to rate. And it turns out that the key to a lot of these horses is putting them on the lead. And um, I don't know if it was Shug McGahee's decision or if Jose Lascano just decided in the moment when some other speed horses either didn't break well or didn't go uh, that he was going to take the bull by the horns and send this filly to the front. But it worked out really well. And I mean, I Jose Lascano that's what he does. When horses break well, he doesn't take away their best weapon. And he's been very successful throughout this entire year doing that, kind of putting horses more forward, even if their PPs didn't show that they would be there. And it worked out well for her. Um, I mean, for people that aren't aware, she's got this massive pedigree. She's by Tappet. She is out of a half-sister to Warfront. Uh, so, I mean... She's always had the ability to be this kind of horse, and it seems like Shug McGahee has just finally figured things out with her. 
Yeah, who knew speed could be an asset? Uh, <laughs> just I kid, of course. <laughs> the only other horse I do, I briefly mentioned Gail, but I actually think that one ran pretty well, and she's one I'd be willing to give another shot. She was obviously done in by the break, but I think she showed some real talent getting up to be. Uh, she almost got within a half length of the lead uh, at one point, so she's not one I'm going to give up on just yet. I think she's a really talented filly. Yeah, I should mention that the really perplexing one was Miss Marissa, who looked like she was going to be part of the pace. And for whatever reason, she wasn't really sent from the inside and she was never a pace factor in that in this race. That probably would not have gotten Mrs. Danvers beat if somebody had pressured her. Um, but I do think it really took away any chance that she would have had. Moving on to Saturday's card at Aqueduct, uh, they ran a few turf races. Uh, we'll talk about two of them. Uh, one was the Aqueduct Turf Sprint Championship. Uh, not the strongest field of turf sprinters that we've seen this year, but I do think we saw a promising winner in the three-year-old turned aside. Uh, this horse had shown uh, some real sprint ability over the summer, beating a field of three-year-olds in the quick call at Saratoga. I know he disappointed at Kentucky Downs last time, but seems like he's putting things all to get together now. As This was a, a nice-looking victory by this horse. It was. Uh, and I've mentioned often on here, horses seem to get a lot of uh, maybe some extra fitness when they run at Kentucky Downs. You don't really have to pay attention to how they finish because it's such a quirky track. And oftentimes you can just put a line through those races, good or bad. They Sometimes they translate, sometimes they don't. But he certainly ran a good one here. That, that 118 time form U.S. speed figure was the best of his career. Uh you know, he beat some decent horses. I, I assume, uh, I don't remember who the favorite was, maybe Therapist, maybe Syaf. But, uh, you know, he beat some established sprinters in here in, in those two. So it was a good effort. And we know it's Linda Rice's specialty is these turf sprinters. So I would imagine this one has a lot of upside in that category. Yeah, and one of the things I like so much about him is that he breaks really sharply from the gate, and that just gives the rider so many options. And Jose Lascano also rode this winner, and he broke on top, saw some speeds were going to the inside, and just kind of perched himself outside those horses racing three wide and took over uh, when was necessary at the top of the stretch. Some others did a little bit of running from behind. Uh, El Tormenta ran fine to be second. Um, True Valor, I think he's showing that sprinting is probably what he wants to do, is he ran okay to be third. There Therapist, uh, I think it was just the wrong distance for Therapist. Um, six furlongs just is way too short for him. I think he's much better going uh, a mile to a mile and a sixteenth. Um, but uh, turned aside, I mean, as a three-year-old beating older horses, that's always something you like to see, especially on the turf, because we don't always see that in these grass races, even at the end of the year. And uh, he could have a big future in turf sprints next year. Yeah, El Tormento was the only other horse I really wanted to mention. Uh, I thought he ran fine. Six furlongs is probably too short for him. I imagine they're going to try to get him back up to a mile, uh, a distance where he's had his most success. So with any improvement in that extra distance, uh, maybe he could get back in the form and be a solid stakes performer again. Now, the race from Saturday's card at Aqueduct, well, probably second only to the Discovery and how much I was impressed, would have been the Central Park and the performance that was put forth by the top two finishers in this race. Uh, these were two-year-olds going a mile and the 16th on the turf, and both Never Surprised and Hard Love seem like two of the best two-year-old turf horses in the country and maybe two of the best two-year-old turf horses that we've seen over the past several years and it's just kind of unfortunate that they're both they both wind up running in the same race yeah this was a big effort for a couple of two-year-olds in here if i'm not mistaken i think we've talked about both of these because they had such big figures on previous space casts and you know it's one i, I when i make figures for two-year-olds especially on turf and get big numbers like that i'm always a little leery because they're for one they're they're always difficult to make because you don't have a lot of data to go on but these two really backed it up. Uh, never surprised, matched his 113 he got in the debut. He was able to handle handle the, the added distance. And Hard Love actually improved his figure a couple points. And they were just much the best in here. I think the third place finisher was about 11 lengths back from the winner. So I, I don't think there's any doubt that these two are, are really good horses. And as I mentioned at the time when, when these races were uh, being run, when they broke their maidens, they were almost as fast to some of the stakes performers we were seeing as three-year-olds. Now, obviously, that group improved a bit in the Hollywood Derby, as they should, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if these turn out to be two special horses. 
Yeah, and I want to make the point, I mean, there was a 10-length margin from these top two back to the rest of the field, and it's not like this was some boggy turf horse at Aqueduct last week that was producing big margins in between horses in stakes races. I mean, we saw plenty of stakes races last week that featured blanket finishes like the Long Island, um, that race that uh, Christoph Clement's Philly Phil Glorious won on Friday. I, this was not the kind of course that some horses were handling and others weren't. These two legitimately ran 10 lengths faster than everybody else. And um, I know Never Surprised was a commanding winner of this race and just ran a, a superior performance to Hard Love. But I mean, there was another speed in this race that dropped the rider at the start or a horse that figured to pressure Never Surprised a little bit. Uh, that was counterfeit currency. And he just was never a part of the race. And I think that put Hard Love in the unenviable position of having to chase that loose leader. And he never really got to him. But I do want to give Hard Love credit for never giving up and even making some inroads into that margin at the very end of the race. Just a really game performance. And we saw the same thing in his debut. This horse just keeps responding to pressure and never stops running. Uh, so just really positive attributes from both of these horses. And never surprised, I mean... He doesn't really have a turf pedigree, and I wonder if they're going to be tempted to try him on dirt eventually, because he's a son of Constitution. He's actually bred on the exact same cross as Tis the Law, as his dam sires by Tis Dow. And um, it's just something that I would wonder about, given the connections. They're not afraid to take a shot with a dirt, uh, with a turf horse racing on turf sometimes. Um, so I'll be interested to see where they go with him. Um, but on the turf, these are two extremely talented two-year-olds. Let's wrap things up at Aqueduct with a couple of races on Sunday, though we're not going to discuss the stakes races. There was a maiden and allowance race that I think, uh, I haven't seen the speed figures yet that Craig made, um, but I would imagine these races came up fast. One of those was an allowance race, an all-motors of one allowance race, going a mile on the dirt uh, that was won by Brad Cox's three-year-old, The Sound. Uh, this horse was coming off a maiden victory and was the second choice to a dare, who, a Neil Drysdale four-year-old, who had just barely lost to four at Dioro in his prior start, uh, but uh, he could never really get close to the sound as the sound showed natural speed from the start and really never let anybody else in the race. Yeah, this was an impressive performance. Uh, my assistant's actually been handling Aqueduct. We've kind of done a switch where I've been doing Del Mar uh, for some, I, I won't get into the reasons, but we'll, we're probably going to flip flap flip flop back here pretty soon. But uh, I looked over the worksheet and I have a pretty good idea. I mean, we almost always come up within a point or two of each other, probably 98% of the time. And I would say the sound's going to get a low 120 speed figure somewhere between like 121 and 123. Uh, it was a big effort. Uh, he had run a big race first time out in defeat. Then he, he actually regressed 12 points when he broke his maiden. He had some trouble that day. The pace was slower, but he just exploded here. And though I don't have the exact number it's going to be a big figure and you know one like what we saw in the discovery almost obviously this is around one turn but this is yet another three-year-old to add to a promising crop yeah, I was going to say, watching this race, it didn't feel like the runner-up Adair regressed at all. It just appeared that he ran into an exceptional performance by the winner of this race. And uh, the sound, I mean, his only loss has come to that very impressive uh, three-year-old idol who uh, beat him when he uh, made his debut at Churchill Downs. And that horse has subsequently gone on to a couple of victories. I know just the way things have fallen, we've never talked about idol on this podcast, but he's a very talented horse uh, that's been based in Kentucky. And uh, the sound, uh, he's got the pedigree to be a good one. He's actually a full brother to Smooth Roller, a horse that I had kind of forgotten about until I looked up his PPs. He was a really good one in California, had won the awesome again with like a 111 buyer um, the year that Byron won the Breeders' Cup Classic, and he got injured and never raced after that, but he was an extremely talented horse, and the sound appears to be on that same path based on this effort. He's going to be stakes bound very soon. Yeah, and it's interesting looking at the chart for the race. I mean, it kind of explains where the big figure come from. He he won by almost five lengths, and the two, three, four finishers last time had all run right around that 110 time form U.S. speed figure, a uh, little bit higher or a little bit lower. So I don't think there's any doubt he beat a, beat a big group and is a promising horse for sure. And we're going to wrap things up at Aqueduct with the race that took place right after the sound ran on Sunday. That was a maiden race for the two-year-old Phillies going six and a half furlongs on the dirt. And uh, Tony Dutrow, he's had a 
slow few years. I mean, he was on top of the game going back five years or so with a bunch of stakes horses in his barn, and things just kind of went quiet for him recently. Uh, but it seems like he's starting to get some good horses into his barn again. We had that turf filly that won at like 100 to 1 a few weeks ago and came back and ran so well on the stakes. And, and now he's got this horse, Miss Brazil, who broke her maiden here. And I don't know what figure you gave this race, Craig. I imagine this one was a little tougher because uh, this race looked like it went just about as fast as the fall highway later on the card and you wonder if two-year-old fillies can run that fast but the margins between these horses suggest that the top two finishers really did run a pretty quick race yeah now like i said i, I don't do the official ones for aqueduct currently but looking at the card to me it, there were four dirt races and, and they all fit pretty closely with each other the one exception could be the sounds race because it was the one that was at a mile and they don't always get grouped together with the other sprints. It just kind of depends how windy it is and things like that. But regardless, this is going to be a, a fast race. Uh, I would guess she's going to get around a 110, which is huge for a two-year-old filly. Uh, but it's not really surprising. I, I think the runner-up uh, ran very well, and it was a big gap back to third. So I would be really surprised if that figure is not similar to what we saw in the fall high weight. I mean, we have to be honest here. We're not even talking about the fall high weight for a reason. It, it wasn't a very strong race on paper. It didn't come up very strong time-wise. And of course, that time is a affected because they're carrying a lot more weight than they usually do. Uh, so that, that probably is a good five or six points off of that figure. But I think the uh, the 110 or so that Miss Brazil is going to get is going to be totally legit. Yeah, and just speaking of weight, um, if you're handicapping those horses coming out of the fall highway in the future using Timeform US, it, you've got those weight adjustments turned on. It'll account for horses carrying more weight when they run back in the fall highway. You'll see their speed figures bumped up a little bit. When I was handicapping the fall highway, I was kind of caught off guard because I was like, wait a minute, I thought this horse ran a much faster speed figure than what I'm seeing, and I forgot I had the weight adjustments turned on. And it'll adjust those down for how, how much horses are carrying. I should say it'll adjust those speed figures up or down for how much weight horses are carrying um in this race compared to how much they carried in their previous starts um so just be aware of that if you're handicapping horses coming out of that race but getting back to miss brazil uh i agree I, this just looks like a legitimately fast race to me and the runner-up caramel swirl she is certainly no slouch i had talked about her quite a bit out of her debut i think we mentioned it on this show and i did a horses to watch segment on her uh because she had been second to Molothod, who came back and won the tempt it had a tough trip in that race uh so she was expected to to improve out of that and I think she did she just ran into an exceptionally talented sprinter in Miss Brazil and Miss Brazil debuted on the turf and um, it seems like dirt is going to be her preferred surface based on how well she ran here she's a half sister to Hammer's Vision who was one of those horses that was a stakes horse on both turf and dirt so she's got one of those pedigrees that can go either way and once upon a time Tony Dutra was really good with second time starters and it seems like uh he can still train when he gets a good horse in his barn. Uh, so uh, just nice to see uh, her run so well for him second time out. It's funny you mentioned that. That was the first thing I looked at to see what we had because we show how a, a trainer does first and second time out. And his numbers just look terrible because he hasn't had any good horses for a while. But I remembered the same thing. He rarely sent horses out well-meant first time and then usually had big jumps the second time. And this is one that certainly fits that pattern. So another sign that, that he's starting to get some better stock. Well, that's all the racing we have to recap this week. Um, we will get back on the typical schedule of the podcast this week after skipping the forecast last week. We'll be recording our Time Form US forecast this upcoming Friday, and I'm sure I'll be focusing on Aqueduct, where they will be riding that Cigar Mile card a week later than Craig would prefer. But seems like we've got an interesting field coming up for that race, and there'll be other stakes on that program, including uh, those two two-year-old stakes, the Demoiselle and the Rebson, that always accompany the Cigar Mile. Uh, so plenty to look forward to this upcoming weekend and craig i'm looking forward to handicapping that this upcoming friday yeah me too uh like i said I'll, I'll get over it i'm not that old i don't want to be the get off my lawn guy I, i'll adjust eventually probably another year or two and it'll just fit perfectly in with my schedule well, everybody, remember that you can always listen to both of these podcasts on DRF.com, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, or SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts. Just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Forum channel and you get our updates about when these podcasts go up. So thanks for listening this week and look out for that Cigar Mile preview podcast coming up on Friday.